Hello, fellow foodies. This is Dr. Cassandra here, and I've got a really special episode for you this week. Have you ever thought about how plants were originally moved around the globe? Um, in the past, actually, thousands of them would die in transit. It wasn't so simple to move things from one part of the globe to the other, and this became really important, especially when you think about the movement of some of our major food crops, like chocolate, chili peppers, um, coffee, all of these fascinating species that were encountered by early explorers that they wanted to bring back to their homelands. Um, it wasn't so simple. And then came along a little innovation known as the Wardian case. And today I'm really excited to speak with an author who's written a fantastic book topic of the Wardian case. I've got Luke Keough on the line. Luke is a curator and historian interested in the global movement of plants in the 19th and earlier 20th centuries. Um, among his many awards and prizes is the Sargent Award from the Arnold Arboretum at Harvard University. He's currently the senior curator at the National Wool Museum in Australia and an honorary research fellow at the Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. In 2020, he's a fellow of the 4A Lab Berlin an innovation humanities research lab supported by the Max Planck Institute for Art History, Florence, and the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. Thanks so much, Luke, for coming on the show. It's great to meet you. Hey, Cassandra. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Great to see you got. So, yeah, <laughs> super excited to be on here. Thanks. Well, I guess the first question is, what got you interested in the Wardian case? Um, are you an avid gardener? Was this kind of what led you to this story? Yeah, um, well, my gardening probably began after, well, at the same time I took up the Wardian case. But the the what got me most interested was that um, I was working in Munich in Germany and I was working on this exhibition and it was about the Anthropocene, this, this idea that um, humans have had this huge influence over the planet. And I was curating this section on um, about moving things around the globe and then um i put a shipping i wanted to put a shipping container and then we ended up it was too big so then we put a a, a a a small version of a shipping container in there and then i thought well this only happened in the mid 19th century surely we've been moving things in some sort of vessels for a long time and so then then i just discovered this wardian case which has this really cool story which i'm sure we're going to get into and i thought well i've got to put one of those in this exhibition <laughs> And so then I um, started doing some searching and then I realized, well, there's actually not many of these around. And so fortunately enough for me, there was one in Berlin. And so I was able to travel up to Berlin and then we were able to put it into the show, which was, which was great. But um, along the way, I just, you find a topic that's super interesting and you get more and more interested in, and I had a passion for plants. I'd worked on a plant previously. And so, yeah. It just, that's great kind of found each other and then the whole time I was working on it, it's always been fun it's never been a drag so it's yeah it's a great topic yeah that's amazing yeah I I had the opportunity um to actually see one of the only 15 remaining original Wardian cases and they have one at um Kew Royal Botanic Gardens in London and I totally geeked out <laughs> in the in the economic botany collection there I I often geek out whenever I'm looking around um in some of these collections um but it's really interesting can you can you describe to us or, or maybe even show us for those of the audience that are able to watch this on the um video version can you show us what a wardian case looks like yeah right. kind of explain okay, cool. it mm -hmm. um so you've seen the one at Q, which is um about four times the size of the one I'm about mm -hmm. to show you I totally geeked out too. We got and I had a replica made um, by some um, really cool people um, in a men's shed. So anyway, I've got it here. I'm not sure if I'm going to fit it on here, but yeah, it's a nice small wooden box, and it's a little bit high. And then it's actually a really simple invention, as long as it doesn't fall off. And I can turn my screen. And yeah. then it's got these little sides that float up, right? Mm -hmm. And then put your plants inside. And you can either do two things. You can put them in pots inside it, or a lot of people in the early days used to put them, put a layer of sort of broken bricks or something like that, and then put a layer of sphagnum moss, and then they put a layer of soil, and then they plant plants into it. The interesting thing about the Wadian case and its construction is that the top here, we've had to go perspex because I'm traveling around all the time. <laughs> 
Yeah. This cool case, so I, I'm worried that the glass is going to break. The problem they'd had back in the 19th century too. But um, yeah, so it was, it was glass across the top, and then um, it secured tight shut. It wasn't hermetically sealed, like it wasn't totally sealed, but it was mm -hmm. uh, tight shut. And then what happens was it sits on the poop deck of a ship, which is the highest part, which gets the most sunlight. And so long as it's got a decent amount of watering and the sunlight hits the sides, then you create this small, let's say, micro environment in which the, um, the perspiration down the sides of the glass then feed back into it and then the plants absorb it and then it keeps going in that cycle. It's kind it of like allows... an internal recycling system. It, it looks a bit like a terrarium in some ways. So it, it, it's the precursor to a terrarium, basically. Mm -hmm. Before what we call today terrariums, you had the Wardian case. And there was kind of two varieties. So the one I've just showed you is, and the one my book's about, is about the traveling one. So you could do two things. One, you could do what was like with a terrarium. You'd put it on your living room table or you put it around your house and be quite beautiful and they wouldn't look as um let's say robust as this one mm -hmm. but they'd be quite beautiful and ornate and glass and whatnot but um these ones were made to travel and so they were made to go on chips they were made to be you know handled quite heavily and these sorts of things so but they weren't huge so they were about almost a, almost a meter wide if not a little bit less, mm -hmm. and then probably about um, 1.5 meters, even closer to 1,200, I think, one at Q is. But that's the other interesting thing about the whole story is that so it wasn't like it was there was a one set design for a Wardian case. It was, and we can get, maybe we'll talk about Ward in a second, but um, yeah. it was this idea of the Wardian case that you could put plants enclosed in these boxes and you could send them on a ship and they could survive for long periods of time. That That's was the point. idea. But botanists all around the world just then went and uh, started to use them and make them in very different ways. So you get ones that are really big and ones that are a bit smaller mm -hmm. and these sorts of things. So they were quite a vernacular style of um, uh, te uh, vernacular technology or something like this. So, Great. Yeah. So this is all during what, what period in history do these become really popularized? So it happens um, from about the 1830s, mm -hmm. and um, basically in 1829, this amateur doctor, Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward, would you like me to tell you a story? Yes, from yes, tell us about Ward, yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> it's kind of, what, it, yeah, it sort of starts with Ward. So 1829, there's this doctor, avid gardener, passionate botanist, um, but an amateur, right? And he discovers that, um, he buries a moth inside a bottle and then he's waiting for the moth to hatch. The moth hatches and then he realizes inside the bottle, well, wait up, this little fern has grown in here. Oh, and he oh. thinks, well, I can't get that fern to grow outside. So if I were to do something similar with my ferns in these glass cases, then it could be quite interesting. So this is 1829. He goes on experimenting with these plants under glass and all these sorts of things for about five years. And he's a pretty cool guy because he's really well connected to a lot of different botanists um, in London. He's living in London, right? And that's the other important thing about his plants under glass, that it's really, we could imagine London, Industrial Revolution, it's really dirty. So to grow plants in the city is a tough thing to do. So therefore, under glass. One of his good friends owns a nursery and one of his good friends and he gets talking and they say, well, this would be a good method to move plants. And so then they do it. 1834, they pack up two of these boxes, probably a bit different to this one. Um, and they put on a ship and they also happen to know a ship captain as well. So that's fortunate. <laughs> He's well connected. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one of the points where he is well connected. But um, and they send on the longest journey you can and they send it to Australia. And um, the, sh the journey takes about seven months and the plants arrive flourishing the ship captain writes back something your experiment for plants sending plants alive at sea is a profound success or something along those but, lines because before this what was it like to ship plants at sea yeah so that's that's the thing so before it there was all these different methods of doing mm -hmm. it and the success rate there was one report from the late 18th century that said only one in 1000 plants 
would survive the journey from China to London. And so that means that to get exotic plants to centers of Europe and also to the USA as well was quite challenging. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see from also from the reports of Bartram and uh, Collinson's connection across um, that it was very difficult to move plants. Yeah. And all the botanists would also know this, that there's kind of differences. You can send plants by seed, but a lot of plants you can't send by seed because of the nature of their seeds or because of the time of year in which you collect them mm. and all those sorts of things. And so sending live plants became a necessity. And then 1830s came along, Ward comes up with this idea and then quite quickly it's jumped upon by a lot of people who are trying to move plants. Wow. And he, he did something I think that was really unique in that he, he did a lot of experimentation at home. Then he did a trial run all the way to Australia. It was successful. And then what happened? Did he, did he, who did he reach out to? Who were his contemporaries that really started using this that made it so popular? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. He, yeah, it's really important point in his story is that he is an amateur. He, he's running a doctor's surgery on as his main business and he get, fits this in when he can. But in those days, if you're, passion is plants and botany, then that's your passion, right? But um, so he sends the Australian shipment. It comes back a success as well. And he starts to tell people through various journals and these sorts of things, a bit like how we do in academia these days. We'll put a journal article out about interesting ideas mm -hmm. and we'll start to see it. But he was also really um, amicable, I would say, and, and well-connected, but also very friendly. And so he starts to tell his friends about it. One of them is this nursery owner that I just told you about, George Lodiges, who owned one of the biggest exotic nurseries in Europe at the time. So almost immediately, Lodiges then puts out, makes 200 of them and puts wow. them into this. And then he's sending out so many plants that the people he sends it to, whether they're in Calcutta or whether they're in all these different places around the globe or whether they're French or whether they're... Um, from the US or all these different places, they see these these cases and then they go, wow, this thing works, let's do it. And so it sort of perpetuates from there. Um, it was a really interesting story of technology. That's great. That's great. Well, as you were researching the book, what were was, was there something that surprised you in, in your research or was there something that really stood at, out as being, um, yeah, just really something you weren't expecting? Um, one of the things that uh, I guess the whole book is about something that I did find interesting from the beginning is that uh, how we how we look at how we moved plants over I'm a historian over a hundred year period, and so for the first fifty years of using this case, people were so excited about moving plants, and so to move plants and to have an exotic plant in your home or or a, an exotic plant in a plantation was really fascinating. But then a shift happens because we've moved plants, we've moved them so well, we start to then realize, oh, wait up, what are we moving? <laughs> and there's all these implications of that. And then we start to analyze all the, all the things we're using to move plants and these sorts of things. So you get all the things we know about, say, invasive species, you get mm -hmm. plant pathogens, you get um, many issues. At the same time, by the late 19th century, so 1890s, 1900, all the, this period of time, 1880s even, we get these very big monocultures starting to happen. Mm -hmm. um, the United States a great example. Oranges is a great one. Um, and other crops such as this. And so to protect those crops, we have to then stop moving these things that are impacting them and yeah. so it becomes a this whole story of our relationship with plants and how it shifts and all these sorts of things and I go into more detail in the book and in other places but that's what surprised me what kept me going over a few years of the research yep it's great well how did how did the um integration of the Wardian case into plant travel really influence food systems? Did we see changes in the types of foods that people now had access to? Yeah. Um, we can talk about a couple of the really big important ones So um, that it's well known for. So uh, 
tea is an interesting one where um, tea was moved from China, where it originally is from, to India, and India set up some large plantations and those sorts of things. It probably wasn't the first thing to move tea from those locations, but it certainly was popularised by the um, botanist Robert Fortune, who, who wrote a couple of very popular stories about all these sorts of things. But once people popularised the ability to move different plants, then we started to move all sorts of things. And so that becomes the interesting part of, as well. So you have a lot of plant explorers going out and getting all these different varieties of plants and then sending them back to centres of botany, whether that's in London, whether that's in Washington, whether that's in Paris. And so it's this ability to move diversity to then put it into what's called the system of nature, so into um, so that identify it, identify its properties, identify what it's connected to in different plant systems, and then you can start to work with it. And that's one of the really interesting parts of plant exploration generally. And this Wardian case was able to feed into that that's to right. identify all these different plants. That's great, yeah. yeah. Because historically, uh, well, we had pressed plants, your herbarium um, curation, and pressed plants are, of course, they're they're dried, smushed <laughs> bits of plants that can be preserved for centuries, but you can't propagate typically from them. They're not live. And so that's one thing I think that's really unique that the Wardian case brought forward was, again, as you said, this ability to not only study the plant on a flat piece of paper, but also to be able to have it grow in a, in a center of botany and education that's great. And it also helped botanic gardens to become such important places, uh, these mm -hmm. storehouses of um, diversity as well, of, of live plants. And then it allowed people to then engage with them, to come, to see them, to enjoy them as well, which is typical. And we still <laughs> have them today. That's great. That's great. Well, were there any other major impacts that you, that you found in your research? Um, we talked about tea. Um, were there other major crops that were impacted through this? Yeah, some really important ones were um, moved by the Wardian case. So, and a couple of them, good examples. So coffee was a really interesting example because clearly it had been moved prior to the 19th century, but then once you had the ability to move it in large scale, then you could move it in these Wardian cases, which is really interesting. Um, uh, Another scholar, Stuart McCook, has identified that coffee rust, that really, um, that disease that impacts it quite heavily, mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. identified in Wardian cases as being moved. So then we see that not only are the plants being moved for plantations, but then you're also getting the um, impacts for those plants. The really important one was probably uh, rubber. So mm -hmm. rubber still is on our tyres, on our bike tyres, um, and Natural rubber is also used really important in the walls of tires. So we're not, we haven't moved beyond using natural rubber just quite yet. Um, but rubber, um, Havea brasiliensis, is originally from South America. It was collected as seeds by an interesting plant hunter, um, Henry Wickham, and then it was taken to Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. And it got there quite quickly, but then to move it from Kew out to the colonies and plantations where it would grow well. So largely in Southeast Asia and those sorts of places, they then propagated the seeds mm -hmm. and those little seedlings were then put into Wardian cases and then they were sent out. So, and now we know today that uh, Southeast Asia is where most of the natural rubber is grown around the world. So wow. rubber, one of the really big important ones and still the impacts of these things are still present today. And that's what's quite interesting is that the, where the plantations are, are places where plants have been moved from. So they're often not in their native home. Ground. That's fascinating. And it has such implications for um, economic development too. I mean, entire economies were developed off of this. This is And, and also it, it, not for the economy, but also for um, social systems and cultural systems, because you have people working either in slave conditions or mm. other indentured labors being laborers being moved from countries so that they could work in these crops. You have people mistreated. You have impact on indigenous populations. So the movement of plants has not always been a good thing, especially for the people where some of these plants are being moved to and you have um, 
exploitation of, of local populations as as these crops are being propagated in these um, large plantations. Um, so it, it definitely had impacts not only on availability of materials, but also local economies and local livelihoods and, and quality of life was impacted. Yeah, so one of the interesting things, and I think um, one thing that jumped out at me in, in reading through a lot of the archival sources was, um, was a, a lot of children were employed to move these Wardian cases, and um, that was quite interesting to hear. It, it, there's, and there's, there's pictures available of children working with, um, with rubber plants in India where they're preparing to be moved on to different colonial plantations and things like that. And so it's, it's interesting that, and this is, why I love working with plants as well is that plants are so fundamental to our society and the way we work and what we eat and what we do, but also fundamental to other parts of how we interact as a society as well. And so I guess there's impacts as well as some huge benefits from the Wardian case. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point. And I, I think it, it, it shows um, it's kind of a preview of where we are today when you think about the movement of people, the movement of species, the movement of pathogens, like COVID, <laughs> um, the more the more movement there is, there's definitely um, some risks that come along come along with that. Yeah. So beyond your work um, as a curator, and actually I, I did want to just touch briefly on your on your current work. This sounds fascinating. You're the curator of a wool museum. Is that what is what does that entail? That sounds really fascinating. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I'm currently the curator at the National Wool Museum in Australia, and um, part of that work involves a whole range of things, but um, Australia was one of the world's biggest wool producers for quite a while, not anymore, and um, where I'm from in Geelong in Australia was the gateway to one of the biggest wool regions that opened up, let's say, um, one of the later frontiers of Australia, um, let's say, and um, so we put on a whole range of shows, but a lot of them to do with wool. One of the most recent ones called On the Land, which starts to look at how wool works in Australia and some of the really important stories of that, but then how it's impacted upon indigenous populations. And one of the really cool projects I've worked on was on native grasslands, oh, which is oh. really interesting for, for hope many of the audiences that the impact on native grasslands in Australia has been quite great. And there's 99% of them have almost been wiped out. And so, but there's this really big push with regenerative farmers now to then use mm -hmm. native grasses in Australia, which is really cool and really innovative. And they're showing that if you feed them to sheep, if you run sheep on native grasslands, you still get the same high quality wool, which is um, these things that are changing around the world, which is really, really fun. So, yeah. That's exciting. And then after researching your book, we were talking earlier, you've gotten into gardening. What are you, what are you growing in your garden right now? Um, in the garden right now, we've got lots of tomatoes coming on, of course, um, mm -hmm. and lots of passion fruits. I live on a really small block, and um, uh, but we've covered most of it with uh, plants. Um, thanks to my wife, who's also a landscape architect, so uh, oh, nice <laughs> involved with it as well. But um, we managed as well to get some chickens as well, so that's great. So everything is coming on. But prior to that, it was all covered in cement, so it's this amazing. Um, it, it's so nice to see when the soil comes back to life. And so that's one of the the things that in my book as well, I got so passionate about the light, the end phases is how soil is this, this lifeblood of our plants, all these things that grow in it. And then to see it in your own garden, to then be growing and, and, and coming back to life and then feeding your plants is, is super fun. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. We have, um, we've just, uh, prepared our raised beds in our little garden in our backyard and I, I have seedlings that are still under grow lights I'm a little bit afraid to put them outside just yet because we've had some cold snaps so I'm like stay inside the warmth for a little bit longer <laughs> I need a I need a large wardian case or a greenhouse yeah, yeah, is what I really need <laughs> so you, when you have your little propagating containers they're exactly the same principle right it, it, yeah. it, kind of you open them a little bit more and these sorts of things but when you have your little propagating container you're growing your seedlings it's the same thing and I always look at it when you're getting your plants ready and you think that Ward discovered this in the 1830s but it was it, it's typical of one of those great inventions is that it was just such a simple idea 
And so yeah. as soon as everyone sees it, they go, oh, well, that's, yeah, of course, I totally understand. Yes, we've got to get these watering cases into process kind of thing. So it's, um, and, and you see it in your own garden, which is really cool. Yeah. That's really cool. And so, he never, he never patented his design, did he? It, so that so, was what allowed for many iterations. That, that's right. And it was one of these things. He was, um, he was a very friendly person, um, very networked, but also um, very caring for others. And I think that most likely probably came from being a doctor and seeing the impact on people and these sorts of things, but um, never painted, patented it. And also was quite, um, he, uh, quite an advocate for these warding cases being sat on windowsills in lower class people's homes and these sorts of things. So they could grow their own vegetables or could oh. grow plants or, and the belief as a doctor as well, that plants have this restorative effect. And this was one of the big things that happened near the late 19th century is that plants in asylums and these sorts of places were really important. And so people having these connections to nature, even small, was really important. And so he stood, he, he went to a, a, a royal commission and, and argued the case that of the importance of um, warding in cases for many people and these sorts of things. And it's um, quite interesting. There's this really interesting quote um, he sent it. In, in a letter to um, Asa Gray, who's the famous uh, American botanist, and they were um, they had a correspondence over 25 years, which was it's wow. quite beautiful. But um, he sends this letter to Asa Gray, and he says something along the lines of that: um, if the British government hadn't have put so much money into their cinchona plantations or their rubber plantations and put more money into um, into the possibilities of um, our lower classes here, imagine what we would have. Um, mm. and what society would be like in London. And it was symbolic of his his thinking around these things and that sort of thing. So That's great. Well, and, and it's just, it's a message I think that we try to continue to share today of like the importance of having access to these fresh produce, no matter where you're at. And I wonder, um, are ha, did you come across any designs online? Like if, like my husband is very handy, he's all into carpentry. So I'm wondering if I can give him a weekend project. Could he p possibly build one of these for me? How, how oh, difficult but, would it be? From the 1860s that it would be totally easy to do. But um, the one that I have here that I showed you was made by, we have men's sheds in Australia where um, a lot of men get together and make things. And this was made by the Hobson's Bay men's shed, which is pretty cool. But um it's also a fascinating example, not just carpenters getting involved and making them, which they, mm -hmm. they make amazingly beautiful ones, but also artists mm -hmm. using them as these examples to, sh to show other things. And then they have lights and all other oh, things. Oh, cool. Yeah, to show the importance of plants. So it's this, um, it also has a symbolic effect, I think, the Wardian case around um, for plant lovers, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm gonna scope out a spot to like fit one in my office. My office is already getting overcrowded with plants. No, you can do a but... <laughs> one. That's fine. You can oh, do a one quarter size one or even one eighth size one. That that's fine. Yeah. That's great. Do orchids do well in the Wardian case? Yeah, yeah, orchids do really well, and um, mm -hmm. orchids are one of the popular ones that went in um, the the um, dining room style. Not only were ferns very popular, but orchids became popular. And then, um, and in between those two was probably rhododendrons. And oh, so, uh, yeah, so these showy sort of plants do do quite well in them, as well as, I guess, if you've got this beautiful thing made of glass and then you've got a orchid sitting inside it, it makes it even more beautiful. So, <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Well, some of the things I just want to showcase here before we wrap up is what I loved about your book, in addition to the beautiful writing and this, the, the, the rich history here, was you, you also had some nice um, photos and this incredible map that's at the very beginning um, for those of you in the audience. And this map just is crisscrossing. You have lines crisscrossing all over the globe between the Americas, you know, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia. And it just really illustrates how extensive these trade routes were and how important um, this innovation was at that time. And today we, you know, benefit from consuming a number of these species that were once originally moved um, through this tool. So great. Well, thank you so much um, for speaking with us today, Luke. This is a lot of fun. And um, yeah, yeah. this is great.
You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious, recorded today on Skype. Um, you can find this and all of our other episodes at our website at foodiepharmacology.com. You can also find the video to this episode where we showed some nice images of a real Wardian case along with some shots of the book at our YouTube channel, which is Teach Ethnobotany under the Foodie Pharmacology playlist. I want to thank the producers, Rob Cohen and Christine Roth from Co-Conspiracy Entertainment. You can also find them at Co-Conspiracy TV or their publishing house at Rothko Press. Thanks so much to everyone for listening, and I hope you'll stay healthy out there, and I'll see you next time.